All right. Would you open your Bibles with me this morning to Romans chapter 4, verses 10 through 13 and 17 through 19. The title of the message today is All in the Family. The good, the bad, the ugly. We're all in the family of God. Amen? All right. Look at your neighbor and tell him, I'm the good, you're the ugly. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. Don't do that, please. All right. Romans 4. But you, why do you judge your brother or sister? Now, let me just give you a quick bit of context. He's talking to them about people who are arguing over how you keep the rules, what you eat, what you don't eat, which day you decide to keep Sabbath on. They're having arguments about who's keeping the rules better, who's doing it right, who's doing it wrong. And he says to them, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all, somebody say all, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me and every tongue will give praise to God. So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us no longer judge one another. Instead, decide to never put a stumbling block or a pitfall in the way of your brother or sister. For the kingdom of God, we're skipping down here, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking or, or playing by the rules, basically is what he's saying, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever serves Christ in this way is acceptable to God and receives human approval. So then let us pursue what promotes peace and what builds up one another. How many of you know God has family values for us? Do you know that? Righteousness, peace, joy. The kingdom of God, the family of God. He wants this to be the atmosphere that we live in, not this critical judging. I'm not sure if I like you. I'm not sure if I feel comfortable around you. I'm not sure if I want to be with you. So maybe I just won't come. No, he wants us to live the way he's called us to live, to have peace with him because of Jesus and what he's done for us. That's our common ground, no matter how different we are. And he wants us to celebrate and have joy together. Doesn't that sound like a beautiful family? Like, do you know that's possible even though we're all messed up? Did you know that? Let's pray. God, thank you that you called us into family. And as a good father, you've set values for your family and your house. You've invited us in. And so, I, God, I pray today that where maybe we're not sure if we want to come in and stay, or maybe we're not sure if we want to let others come in and stay, I pray today that we would gain your heart and your eyes for you, for ourselves, and for each other, so that we could be the happy family that you've called us to be, and the mighty family that you've called us to be. Show us how to take our place, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Put your hand on, the heart, on your heart and ask Holy Spirit to speak to you today. Not your neighbor, you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. All right. <clears throat> From the beginning, God intended for all of his kingdom people to be a family. And he intended that through his family, he would reveal himself to the whole world. So that's why family is so much under attack. It's become so messed up, right? But as we said, God's not done with family. And if God's not done with family, then how many of you know you and me can't be done with it either? We don't have the right to walk away from what God hasn't walked away from, right? So in scripture, we see God's design and his heart for family. Um, God is passionate about family, and I believe God's rebuilding family. Um, and I believe that he's doing it through the church. I do. I believe that the church is the instrument through which God is restoring families. I need you to hear that with me. Today, I want to look at the larger context of family, and that being the family of God, the church family of God, okay? And I want to look at it through the lens of God restoring, using us, restoring us, and then using us to restore the families that we run into or that he brings into the house. And so I, I had the privilege of um, going to sort of a conference last week, and I spent the, the week with all different kinds of people from, I mean, all different places. So beautiful to see so many different kinds of people. I mean, there were people that came that couldn't speak English, you guys. And they came to an only English-speaking conference because they were so hungry for the presence of God that they just believed if they just got in that atmosphere that something would hit them. 
That is beautiful to me because they had the drawing. The, the Bible says we can't come. We can't come unless we're drawn by the Spirit. They felt the drawing of the Spirit to go to a place that was so uncomfortable, knowing and trusting and believing that they were supposed to be there. Is that amazing? And I just met so many wonderful people. Not more wonderful than you, of course, because you're my favorite. But I fell in love all over again with the family of God. I fell in love with God's idea of family. But I, I know that it isn't always that way, right? I know we get weird with each other. And we are not really always sure that we love each other. And I think in the early years of my, of my church life, and, and because of some of the experiences I had both with family and with church, I, I wasn't really sure that I could recognize love or that I could recognize family or that it was really, I, I just thought I could do it myself. I thought I could love God over here and I didn't need church, right? I want to tell you I was wrong. I was wrong. That's not God's plan. I, I want to be honest because we're, like, we're, this is such a wonderfully awkward space. <laughs> and in this room, we have people for whom church and the family of God have become a part of our life's fabric. We're here because we love the Lord with all of our heart, and we're committed to serving him. We're committed. We've devoted our lives. We know that this is where we're supposed to be. Better is one day in God's house than anywhere else. There are people in this room who've made that decision. I'm one of them. But I also know that there are other people in the room who are like me, like how I used to be. You're not really sure if you want to be in the house of God. You, you think you love God. You think you're okay with God, but not so much about his people, right? It's okay to say, it's okay to admit to that because historically speaking, the people of God haven't always been great representatives of God. And I've done, I've been that. I, as a, even as a person in God's house, I haven't always represented him in a way that would make you want to stay, right? So it's okay to be awkward and to be wherever you are in this, in this situation because we're going to talk about God's heart for that particular thing today. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I used to say, and this is probably terrible, but like I always felt more comfortable outside the church. You know, I always felt more comfortable in like the deep, dark places of the world, because um, that's where I came from. You know, and I came into church, and I I saw what I became eventually. I saw those people who didn't make me feel comfortable, and I used to say, "Man, I think I'm more afraid of church people than I am of demons. Like I'd rather hang out with the darkness than I would with religious people." I really felt that way. And it's okay to laugh and it's okay to giggle because some of you feel that way too. And for some of you, it's my fault. It's our fault. So today I'm going to take responsibility for that, but I'm also going to hold up the other side of that coin for you. God told us a story in the Bible about family <clears throat> that's going to help us today to figure out where we're at and what to do about it because God gets it too. How many? God knows that his family is dysfunctional. I hope that doesn't offend you. I hope you don't think you're not dysfunctional because all of us are in some way. We are. We're messed up. We've been through the world, right? God knows his family is dysfunctional. He's not upset about that. But what he is doing is he's drawing us to get closer in our dysfunction, to love and celebrate each other, what's good about each other, rather than judging each other, and to grow together. He knows how to get past that, right? When Jesus told stories um, in the Bible, he, he told stories to illustrate to kind of create pictures in people's language and in terms they could understand because he talked about things that were in their part of their everyday world. And so he would tell stories to, to portray what he's talking about. He also told stories to hide things from people who weren't quite ready to respond for, to them. But his stories were always an invitation to people who were hungry. Are you hungry? Are you hungry? I'm hungry. I'm hungry to see what God has promised happen in the world. I'm hungry to see mighty God do what I know and I've always been told he could do. I'm hungry to see the works of the devil destroyed against my community and my family and my world. I'm sick and tired of the brokenness that God did not create. Are you hungry? Jesus told stories for the hungry so that we would press in and lean in and say, tell me more, Jesus. 
Now you could always be sure if Jesus told a story that you were in it. So what I'm, I'm proposing today is that when we read this story, we lean in and we say, Jesus, show me where I am in this story. Show me what you need to do in me, in my heart. Luke chapter 15 tells a story. Many of us who are churched know it as the prodigal or the lost son. And he tells the story to illustrate a point that he's been making already, which is the joy of lost things being found. And if you've been in church for any time, um, you know what it feels like because you've been found. We've been found by the Lord. And that's why we worship the way we do. That's why we celebrate the way we do. Because we've been found. What a joy to have been rescued, right? And so Jesus tells this story to continue to illustrate the point of there's joy, some, such great joy in heaven and among God's people when the lost things are found. So Luke chapter 15, verse 11, I'm going to read you this story. And if you would just, you don't have to close your eyes, but if that helps you focus, just try to put yourself in this story. Try to hear, try to go where Jesus is leading us. Jesus told this story. He said, a man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed up all his stuff, all his belongings, and he moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. So he persuaded a local farmer to hire him. The man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs, and the young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I'm going to go home to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Would you please take me on as a hired servant? So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. And his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his fingers and sandals for his feet, and kill the calf we've been fattening up. We must celebrate. Somebody say celebrate. We must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. So the party began. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back. He was told, and his father, he was told, and his father, your father has killed the fatted calf. We're celebrating because of his safe return. But the older brother was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, All these years, all of these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back, after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fatted calf? His father said to him, my dear son, you've always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and he's come back to life. He was lost, but now he's found. There are three characters in this story. There's the younger, irresponsible one who has no value for what the father gives. There's the older, responsible one who works hard but has lost the sake of who has lost the art of enjoying and celebrating what has always belonged to him. And then there's a father who loves both of them and gives both of them equal. Like, there's no end to his love. There's no end. No matter how much you fail, no matter where you get it wrong, I'm still going to love you. I'm still going to celebrate you. That's God. 
you and I are one of the other two. There's no third brother in the story. We're either the one that comes in and we serve God and we commit and we're faithful and we show up and we do the stuff we're supposed to do and in our hearts we get more bitter and more jealous and more angry at all the people who are living free out there and don't have any sense of responsibility and I have to do it all myself. And we get grumpy and we stop looking like the father so that when the, when the little ones come in, they look at us and they're like, oh, if this is how it is in my father's house, I don't want to be in my father's house. See, they love God. Some of you love God, but you don't like what we've looked like to you. So you take what God has given you, because how many of you know the Bible says God's gifts and his callings are irrevocable. You're called. Oh, you have gifts. But if there's not a safe house and a, and a healthy family for you to operate those in, you're just going to take it out there and try to operate it there. But I want you to know there's no brother with one foot in the house and one foot out. Jesus said, if you're not with me, you're against me. Either you're in my family and you're with my people or you're cut off. Now look, he still had the gifts and the calling. He still had what God gave him, but it ran out out there because it's meant to operate in connection. Are you hearing me? Some of you, God is calling you to his house and to be part of his people and I, as one of the older sisters, I want to apologize to you for the way that the church has conducted itself. Because we haven't celebrated you. Maybe not this house, maybe a different house, maybe this house. But I know that there have been plenty of you in this room that we've criticized you and we've held you down more than we've lifted you up and celebrated what's great about you and what God is doing in you. And I want to say I'm sorry on behalf of the church because it's not okay. God is not pleased with that. And I've repented and I've committed to loving and serving and lifting you up and helping you see what God sees in you. But those of you who've sat back and judged us, you know, God wants you to love us too and see what's good about us too because sometimes we get trapped under the burden. Sometimes we get stuck. I, I, maybe you think the devil's only out there, but he's actually in here too. He comes to church and he runs amok here and he does, you know, his, his stuff to us too. And so maybe you're mad at us and maybe you, you have the right to judge us, but actually we need you to love us and partner with us too. We need you to come into the house and, and take your place so we can do what we do together, so we can be a family, so we can get healed, so that when people walk in, they see older and younger walking together, and they see unity, and they say, oh my God, he's, he must be in this place. This is what family's supposed to look like. So I just want to... I just want to call us today to a real place of examination of our hearts. And I want to ask that wherever you are, on whichever end of that, that picture you find yourself, all three stories that Jesus told in this chapter, the word joy and party and celebration were lifted up. And really, if we get our eyes, if each one of us gets our eyes off of each other and back on the Father, it's going to be really easy for us to celebrate. Because you know what happens for, what happens a lot of times for the ones who, who don't want to be here and who go out there and try to, try to be God and, and have a relationship with God out there? Sometimes we create this false cycle of joy and celebration where we have to be lost in order to be found, in order to experience the joy again. Are you hearing me? How many times do we have to go out and come back in so somebody will recognize us and celebrate us? We're supposed to live in celebration. We're supposed to live in celebration. And I want to tell you that it's, it's here. But I can't create it by myself. 
I need your help. I need you to be here with me. And, and maybe, again, maybe it's not here in this house. If you're from another church and you're called to that church, by all means, build with your church. But each and every one of us have a place in God's family. And it's time for the church to reconcile. It's time for the church, for the brothers and sisters in Christ, to love each other and stop judging each other. <clears throat> But I want to say something else to you. Scripture actually does tell us in 1 Corinthians 5, 5, 12, that we're not supposed to judge people outside the church, people who don't belong to the family of God. But you know we're actually called to judge each other? You're like, how does that make sense? You just told us not to judge each other. The only way that we're going to grow is if we're, we create a culture that celebrates and calls out the beautiful things, the good things, the gifts. The, we recognize who, who we are, but we also give each other room in that environment, in that culture we create where we safely love one another and call out the gold in each other. Then we also have the right and the privilege to tell each other, man, that's not who you are. Come on, let's come up higher. Come on, let's be better together. Come on, you know that doesn't befit you. You're a son of the king. You're a daughter of the king. Come on, don't do that. That's the kind of judgment God calls us to. So it's not like we just come in and live however we want because we have to uphold what God has given us as the banks to the river, right? There's supposed to be freedom in God's house, but freedom within the banks that he's given us, right? Well, there's a lot of freedom to be had in the way that God's blessed us to live, but we have to remain committed to, to living in this space, right? God's family is supposed to be beautiful and wonderful and an incredible space to step into where heaven is released. And so I think it's too easy for us to step into a house of God and sense everything heaven isn't releasing <laughs> and just not want to be part of it. But I think God would, would compel us to actually get closer, to actually lean in. Because as I said earlier, whatever the enemy's doing a work, it's because he's trying to distract from what God's actually doing. Can we learn to see what God's doing instead of what the enemy's doing? Do you think that we could do that together? Do you think we could look at our brothers and sisters when they're stumbling and struggling and making us mad and say, okay, God, what are you doing in his life? Let me, let me focus on that thing. And actually then let me, let me give my amen to that thing and let me become a partner with that thing. And instead of like, okay, Lord, bless him. No, brother, let me hold you up for a minute. Brother, let me walk beside you. Brother, let me pick you up. You know, I love watching my husband and Papa Jeff. They're hilarious together. Papa Jeff, when he's hurt, like physically hurt, my husband picks him up and gives him like the back crack of a lifetime. Like it scares me. I think one of them's gonna go to the hospital, right? Or the, he'll put him down on the floor and start doing the smackdown. I'm like, oh my gosh. But like, can we love each other like that? Can we get our hands in each other's lives rather than just stand back and not be part of what God's doing in each other? How many of you want a healthy family? Um, how many of you want a healthy family? How many of you know that that healthy family isn't going to create itself? How many of you are parents in here? It's like trying to get your hands around a three ring circus, right? Like it's a lot of work to make it work. You can see how it's supposed to be, and most days it doesn't go that way, and it's frustrating, and it's exhausting, and you go to bed like wondering if I made any difference at all, right? But if you give up, what happens? All hell breaks loose. I don't know about you, but all hell is not going to break loose in my house and in my family. I'm not going to give it the right. I might struggle and I might limp and I might have some things I need to apologize for when I get it wrong because I am going to get it wrong. But all hell will not have its way in my family, not on my watch. 
nor in the house of God that I'm called to love. So some of you might think I'm like the bossy big sister. You, please don't raise your hand. I know I've had these conversations with some of you love me and think I'm wonderful, but some of you have had your opinions about me and that's okay, as I, I haven't always presented it right. I haven't always done it right. I know I've failed trying to figure it out. But I'm gonna, I want to tell you that it's better for us to try to figure it out together and bumble our way along than it is to not try at all. I, I remember I had my favorite uncle. Um, he, he really blew it one time, like blew it bad and hurt a lot of people when he blew it. And I was so mad at him. I drove my car all the way to where he was so I could look him straight in the eyes and tell him how mad at him I was. And I let him have it. I told him, you blew it. How could you do this? And I'm sorry I ever believed in you. And you know what he said to me? His whole face just softened. Like, who does that? He should have rebuked me. His whole face softened and his eyes melted. And he just said, oh, Shani, don't ever be sorry for believing in anybody. If you don't believe in each other, then what do we have? And I thought, it stunned me. Because his charge was, I, I might have gotten it wrong and I might have really failed. But you still need to believe in me. You still need to believe in the next one God sends to you. That's hard. We get hurt, we hurt each other, and it's easier to walk away. I come from a family of runners. We quit. But that's not the family you've been called into. You've been born into a new family where the Spirit of God lives in us, and we don't quit. We don't give up. We don't run away. We stay, and we fight, and we build. We build together. Listen. I know that the last two or three years have been devastating. I know that like so much has been leveled. Anybody can see that. Anybody can see what the enemy has done. But can you see what God is doing? Because you know what I see? I see that God has taken his hand and swept a giant floor clean so that he can rebuild the structure that's going to stand until his son returns. Are you going to be part of that? Or are you just going to keep shaking your head and walking right past it? So I want to tell you, if you're here today, you have an appointed place in the family of God. And it's time to stop running. And if you're in the family of God, and you're tired, and you're burnt out, and you're jealous, and you're angry, it's time to repent. And it's time to get our eyes back on God. And it's time to love each other. And it's time to rebuild. Will you give your yes, will you give your amen, excuse me, to God's yes? And that means, will you take responsibility for the peace that is yours? I can't answer that question for you, but I know that's what God is asking for each one of us. So we're going to do something a little unconventional to end today. If you'd stand up to your feet with me. First, I'm going to read some of the more family values over us. Just to remind you the family that God is building, okay? It doesn't matter where man has failed. We're looking at what God is building. God's family values are righteousness. That means we live the way God called us to, and we're only able to do that because of what Jesus has done. I can't try hard enough and get it right. You can't either, okay? Peace with God. There's no condemnation here. God is not judging us. He's saving us. He's making us better. He loves us. There's joy in the Father's family. We're called to celebrate each other and see the best in each other. Provision. God supplies everything that we need. Love. Not the kind of love we're used to. Not broken love. Real love. Committed love. Patient love. Kind love encouragement, 
holiness. Holiness is not starchy, y'all. It's not. Holiness is not what's been handed down from generation to generation, grandma's china that sits in the cabinet, nobody ever better touch it because it's too good for you. It's break out the family china and set the table because it's been reserved for a special time. And guess what? When God killed, when the father in the story killed the fatted calf, it means he laid out the biggest celebration. He took what was reserved for something so incredibly honorable and special and he gave it to the one that didn't deserve it. Holiness means we know we're called to something amazing, so we live like it. That's the culture of God's family. Connection and cooperation. Maturity. We grow up together. We grow better together. We forgive each other. We're patient with each other. We live by the truth. We live by the truth, and we love the truth. We don't use it to beat each other over the head. We love the truth. We celebrate the truth. And we live in mission. We have an assignment. And we're courageous for that assignment to see families restored, to see our world better, to destroy the works of the enemy. Do you want to be part of that family? Because I want to be part of that family. That's the family I want to help God build here. What about you?